director here at the Federalist Society. And it's my privilege today to welcome our two speakers, Mr. Josh Hammer and Professor William Bode. Mr. Hammer is the opinion editor at Newsweek, a research fellow with the Edmund Burke Foundation, counsel and policy advisor for the Internet Accountability Project, a syndicated columnist through creators, and a contributing editor at Anchoring Truth. A frequent pundit and essayist on political, cultural, and legal issues, Mr. Hammer is a constitutional attorney by trade. He hosts the Josh Hammer Show, a Newsweek podcast, and is the co-host of the Edmund Burke Foundation's Nat Con Squad podcast. Prior to joining Newsweek and the Daily Wire, where he was an editor, Mr. Hammer was an attorney at a large law firm and clerked for Judge James C. Ho of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Mr. Hammer has also served as a John Marshall Fellow with the Claremont Institute, graduated from Duke University with a degree in economics, and earned his JD from our very own University of Chicago Law School. Professor Bode is the faculty director here of the Constitutional Law Institute and a professor of law at the law school. His current research interests include the original meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, the Doctrine of Severability, and the zero if restatement of the conflict of laws. Among his other activities, Professor Bode is co-editor of the textbook, The Constitution of the United States, a member of the American Law Institute, where he has advised on the third restatement of the conflict of laws, and a host of two podcasts, Descending Opinions and Divided Argument. Professor Bode also recently served on the Presidential Commission on the Supreme Court of the United States. Before joining the faculty here at UChicago, Professor Bode was a fellow at Stanford's Constitutional Law Center and a lawyer at Robbins Russell in Washington, D.C. Professor Bode graduated from the University of Chicago with a B.S. and earned his J.D. from Yale Law School. Professor Bode then clerked for Judge Michael McConnell on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals and for Chief Justice John G. Roberts of the United States Supreme Court. Please welcome our panelists today. Our uh, format is going to be a debate on common good originalism. And so we'll have 15 minutes for Mr. Hammer and Professor Bode at the end uh, of the 15 minutes. I'll give you a two minute warning and then let you know uh, once the time has expired and then we'll have five minute rebuttals for each speaker and a, and a Q and A to follow. So please welcome our speakers. Uh, I think the most impressive part was the fact that you memorized all that. that was, uh, <laughs> I, I, I could definitely not do that, but very impressive, honestly. So thank you guys for having me. I mean, the most, for, for present purposes, the most important part of my bio that was not stated explicitly was the fact that I was a three-year board member here at the University of Chicago Federal Society chapter. Um, so kudos to you guys for having just this, this incredible stretch of events. And you have my good friend, Free Shaw, on Monday. This, and I saw Jay Bhattacharya and my former boss, Judge Ho, next week. I mean, that is an action-packed little stretch there, so kudos to you guys. Um, the, for me personally, the, the, I think the most rewarding part of this particular event is I kind of do the Common Good Originalism Roadshow at a bunch of lawyers' chapters and law student chapters across the country. But for me, the best part of this event is that I have my own former constitutional law professor to tell me exactly how wrong I am. Um, <laughs> um, so I had Professor Bode for both, both Con Law 1 uh, and Constitution in Congress seminar, uh, if I recall, where we kind of poured through David Curry's work. Um, and it, the irony is not lost on me that the uh, Josh Hammer student of Will Bode version of myself, not that long ago, eight years ago, probably would have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, utterly just distraught at what I'm about to say. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, just so um, perhaps we'll see how Professor Bode will, will tell the 2023 version of myself how the 2015 version of myself is actually correct all along. Um, so let's begin here. So common good originalism, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, I think, to talk about kind of what common good originalism is without kind of first defining what originalism is. After all, why would we kind of fix this uh, modifier at, at the beginning of the term there? Um, and, you know, I, I'll come back to this uh, probably if I have time at the very end, to the idea here that the exact kind of methodological approach as I prescribe it at, at greatest length in the Harvard JLPP article on this topic that came out in June 2021, Although the way I kind of lay it out is novel, and the way that I try to frame it is novel, I, I very much kind of view this as kind of capturing an older tradition. I'm, I'm really not trying necessarily to kind of come up with anything out of whole cloth. I'm just trying to kind of recover a tradition in many ways from my perspective that has been lost, and the, and the specific way that I, the means that I used to get there are maybe different, but the overall kind of approach I think is actually quite familiar, or at least would have been familiar to kind of previous generations of legal and political luminaries. So as to the question as to what is originalism, um, so 
Uh, I kind of have a two-pronged answer to this. Um, I say this obviously as, as someone who's literally been a card-carrying member of the Federal Society since the very first day I set foot on this campus. My card is still in my wallet as I speak right now. Um, so for me, originalism, the, the answer is kind of a two-pronged answer. So part of it, um, and this is the part where I think kind of Professor, Professor Vermeule, where I should stipulate, by the way, Adrian is a friend of mine. I have serious disagreements with, with, with Adrian. It's actually a forthcoming uh, Harvard JLDP symposium that we're going to tease out some of these differences, so be on the lookout for that. But my, the point is, my theory is not synonymous with his. But one of the one of the kind of points about originalism that I think Adrian likes to make is he is he likes to kind of frame originalism and its kind of rise in the early 1980s is very much kind of being kind of a time, place, and manner response to the both perceived and also very real excesses of the Warren and Burger courts over the past, you know, 25, 30 years prior to kind of the ascendance of the Federal Society. And I think that, I think that there is a lot of truth to this. I mean, kind of being putting on my kind of day-to-day -day kind of political commentator hat, less so kind of my legal theorist hat, you know, I mean, it, it seems to me true that it's very difficult to kind of extricate kind of the intellectual ferment that was there in the 1980s here at this law school with uh, then UChicago Fed's Lock Advisor, Anthony Scalia, folks like that. It is difficult to kind of extricate that from the broader kind of political, cultural, and civilizational milieu that was happening at the time. We're talking here, of course, about kind of the 1980s, the Reagan Revolution. Ed Meese was very involved there. He's still involved at, at, at the Heritage Foundation today. It's kind of this broader idea of kind of, uh, you know, what Patrick Deneen might kind of derisively refer to as kind of foundersism, this kind of real strong emphasis on the American founding. I don't say that derisively, by the way. I'm, I, I, am a, I am a partisan of the American founding. I happen to like the American founding a lot. But that was kind of the kind of uh, obvious kind of social and political milieu of everything that was happening there in the 1980s, this general notion of kind of making the American founders great again. The natural corollary, I think, for kind of this first wave of leading kind of FedSoc intellects, folks, folks like the late Justice Scalia, the late Judge Bob Bork, the natural corollary, and this is why it was kind of also kind of a time, place, and manner response, I think, to the Warren and Burger courts, was this heavy idea of judicial restraint. Uh, to this day, I could, I could bring out and show you the FedSoc membership card has that famous quote from Hamilton, Federal 78, on the back of the card. You know, the judiciary shall have neither force nor will, but merely judgment, and it depends upon the executive branch even for uh, the enforcement of, of its judgments. That, that is still printed on the cards. That is kind of a key into judicial restraint. Um, and here's, here's kind of my first bone to pick, um, I think, with originalism as some theorists, perhaps less so nowadays, but, you know, some perhaps, uh, like Ed Whelan, for example, um, who have debated on this topic, some still kind of present originalism through kind of a judicial restraint framework. The problem with this kind of I would say somewhat sloppy intellectual conflation between originalism and judicial restraint is that they're simply not the same thing. Judicial restraint is a claim about institutional allocation of power. It makes no interpretive claim whatsoever about how a particular word, clause, verse, or phrase ought to be interpreted when an interpreter or expositor is presented with a clause, particularly when that clause is genuinely ambiguous. Now, it is true, of course, that um, the folks in this line of thought, kind of the more kind of what I refer to as the positivist or historicist kind of uh, judicial restraint heavy form of originalism, what they typically say, what they typically say, and I, I, Ed has said this to me when we have done this exact exchange, he says to me that you know, when you're in the so-called construction zone, what you ought to do is just defer to democratic majorities. You ought to defer to the legislature. And I think some folks in this school of thought view this as kind of the morally neutral way out. This is kind of the enlightened thing to do. Is that, you know, judges just don't say anything, just defer. The problem, this is kind of my overarching, this is my big problem here. This is my big problem with kind of the way that this argument has gotten formulated. I don't think that's morally neutral. I don't think that there's necessarily such thing as moral, moral neutrality when you get to this stage of the interpretive or construction enterprise within the zone of, ge of genuine, reasonable ambiguity. And the reason that that is not a neutral way out is because what you are implicitly doing there, when you simply defer to democratic majorities to legislatures, you are implicitly making a pro-democracy value judgment. I mean, to kind of be a little cheeky here, uh, this is what the left says these days when they kind of rage about our democracy, right? Uh, query whether they're intellectually earnest or serious about that, that's really neither here nor there. Um, a, a more historical example of that I mean, would be, this is basically, uh, I, I guess I'll just go there, this, this is basically what Stephen Douglas said to Abraham Lincoln in 1858 over and over again, right, when he appealed to popular sovereignty, let the people decide, I mean, defer to democratic majorities, but, you know, if we, if we learn anything from the great statesmanship of Abraham Lincoln, whose birthday is this Sunday, I'm very blessed to be born on his birthday, actually, um, uh, if, if you learn anything from Abraham Lincoln, it is that sometimes there is something to be said for appealing to something substantive, something transcendental over 
the appeals of rote, of, of rote kind of might makes right majoritarianism, the likes of which Madison also would have decried in his famous essay, The Federalist Tenth. So this is kind of one of my bigger critiques of kind of this judicial restraint heavy form of, of originalism. Uh, to, to originalism, as was originally formulated to its great credit, of course, it wasn't just a time, place, and manner thing that, you know, I think when Adrian does that, he sells it very short. Obviously, this method of, of constitutional interpretation was pervasive, if not ubiquitous, at the time of, of the American founding. James Madison himself has this famous quote where he says, you know, I entirely concur in the notion that the Constitution ought to be interpreted according to the meaning ascribed that by its ratifiers, and that sense alone is a legitimate Constitution. That's a slight paraphrase, not quite verbatim, but you get the basic idea here. Um, so, you know, this is kind of the first form of, of, of originalism throughout the 1980s, throughout the 1990s here. Um, corpus linguistics, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it. I would submit to you that that is kind of the logical endpoint of this form of originalism. I'm not necessarily saying that if Justice Scalia were alive, he would have been a corpus linguistics fan, but I think that this kind of uh, overly kind of roboticized kind of algorithmic approach, to, uh, this software program kind of esque approach to discovering historical legal terms um, is it, kind of the logical endpoint. And again, my, 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 to kind of go back to Lincoln and the idea of, of substance here, my fundamental problem here is that when you get to this point, when you are in kind of the so-called construction zone, a zone of reasonable ambiguity when it comes to some of what we, should, you know, with kind of full Burkean epistemological humility, we should be willing, to, we should be willing to concede some of these sweeping magisterial clauses, first, fourth, ninth, fourteenth amendment, perhaps. Maybe they actually are a little more reasonably ambiguous than some originalist scholars have or theorists have told us they are. The point here then is, what do you do? And there have been various answers kind of you know, posited over the years as to, what you, as, as to what you do. The judicial restraint kind of pro-democracy crowd have, has their answer. You just defer to democratic majorities. Um, you know, there are some more kind of libertarian-leaning originalists um, who have a different answer as well. Uh, so Professor Barnett, who uh, I know he was here recently as well, Randy's a personal friend. I, I like Randy a great deal. And Randy has changed his approach to constitutional interpretation since his 2004 book. He, he has changed it quite significantly, actually. But his 2004 book, for those of you who are familiar, was entitled Recovering uh, the Lost Constitution, the Presumption of Liberty. So for a certain strand of libertarian-leaning originalists, the subtitle of that book is Presumption of Liberty, this idea that you will approach these genuinely ambiguous terms through the analytical prism of individual liberty or individual autonomy maximalism, I think would be an example of kind of one form of libertarian originalism. That's how you get to, for example, kind of the argument that uh, Lawrence versus Texas might be rightly decided uh, and things of that nature. So uh, I don't agree with that, but I will at least kind of readily concede that they're on to the right path when it gets to kind of this affirmative pronunciation that when you get to a zone of reasonable ambiguity, you have to make a choice. There is no morally neutral way out here. That is kind of my fundamental lesson here. So upon thinking about this problem over the past few years, as I, as, as I initially started to think about it, and you know, Adrian and I had discussed it, and the Bostock case came down, I, I, I gave a lot of thought as to you know, what, what do you do? <laughs> Actually, like, what do you do when you are here in a, a zone of genuine kind of ambiguity? And again, we're not talking here about the easy cases. We're not talking here about the dollar amounts for you know suits uh, at common law on the Seventh Amendment. We're not talking about 35 years of presidential eligibility. We're talking here about genuinely ambiguous, reasonable kind of close cases. And my own answer to this question is that you should err on the side of what I have referred to in my writings and talks as the telos, what Aristotle called the telos of the American constitutional order. Um, it, it, Blackstone, quite similarly, would have, would have referred to this as the ratio legis, the reason of the law. This is kind of the reason that the law exists in the first place. It is the substantive, overarching, purposive orientation to which this entire edifice is, is oriented. And I would submit to you that the normative legitimacy of a legal regime's telos is that which makes it respecting as law qua law in the first instance. This is the very reason that whatever the communists and the Nazis purported to write down as law but whether it was positivist enacted or, or not, this is why it's fundamentally not worth respecting, it's because it was oriented towards illegitimate, or as the case may be, outright evil ends. But you know, in the US constitutional order, we have a very clearly defined telos, and it's right there in the preamble of the Constitution. Quote, we the people of the United States, in order to form, form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, 
promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. I would argue too that that is normatively legitimate. I mean, if, if I were asking you what are kind of the, the, the great teachings of the Western canon going back to, to Greece and Rome as to like what you would try to do when you were establishing constitutional order, it would look quite a bit like that. And it doesn't take a genius to kind of see this and see that these are not necessarily kind of you know, ends that are oriented towards kind of idiosyncratic norms of individual liberty or individual autonomy maximalism. And these are actually more kind of communitarian, kind of common good, health of the whole oriented ends. More perfect union, domestic tranquility, common defense, general welfare, and so forth. So my basic claim here is that we should be, for good Burkeans, we should be epistemologically humble about having a slightly broader construction zone in certain areas of reasonable ambiguity. And then when we were in that construction zone, explicitly err on the side of the telos of the American constitutional, constitutional order, because that is what makes it worth respecting as law in the first instance there. A great example of how this was done in kind of the older republic, I think kind of intuitively, not even necessarily thinking about it, would be Chief Justice Marshall and McCullough versus Maryland, which I view as kind of a crypto common good originalist opinion, where Chief Justice John Marshall very explicitly sides on behalf of the Hamiltonians, the Federalists, um, in juxtaposition to the Jeffersonians, took a much more kind of individual liberty maximizing, government shrinking, kind of absolutely strictly necessary view of necessary property clause. You know, his famous line, let the ends be legitimate, and so forth there, that is very much kind of a, kind of an overcoming good originalism opinion, you might say. Um, because I'm running short on time, I'll just give one very brief, very quick uh, modern example. One of my favorite examples here would be the free speech clause. Uh, so I'm looking here to cases like U.S. versus Stevens in 2010 and my personal favorite, Snyder versus Phelps in 2011. These are both eight to one decisions. Uh, my favorite justice, the courageous justice, Sam Alito, is, is, is the sole dissenter both of these times. So in Snyder versus Phelps, Mr. Phelps, who's the Westboro Baptist Church guy, he's not a good person. He's saying these horrible epithets on this public sidewalk for the military funeral. If you guys are at all familiar with Westboro Baptist Church, you know how this goes down. Um, the question gets litigated to the Supreme Court, basically. Uh, long story short, the QP presented to the justices is, is this or is this not First Amendment protected free speech? By an eight to one margin, the court says yes, for you know very simple reason. Uh, you, you, know, you know, as Anthony Kennedy says in Citizens United, it is our law and our tradition that more speech, not less speech, is the answer. It's kind of a similar idea here. Alito says no. And he says no because he has kind of a much more kind of common good, we might say, oriented view of the role that free speech plays in a free society, where free speech is less kind of an intrinsic good unto itself, where you have intrinsic worth every time saliva comes out of your mouth. Rather, kind of old school kind of Socratic style, going back to the very purpose of the Socratic dialogue that we still have in law schools today, speech is better viewed as more of an instrumentality towards arriving at something resembling societal truth. And from this respect, the alleged speech that was being admitted by Mr. Phelps might have been biological speech insofar as the particles are coming out, but it is not speech insofar as our First Amendment is concerned. It is so utterly blasphemous to the flag, the military, the customs, traditions of this republic. It is so outside the norms of anything remotely uh, getting at speech. That's kind of my paraphrasing. I'm not saying Alito said it like that, obviously. Uh, but I know I'm short on time, so maybe it's time to hear Professor Bowden, and then I'll respond. Thank you. Classroom with Josh would not be the one like controlling the pace of the conversation and able to just, like, <laughs> move on and call on somebody else. Uh, and you know, I'm aware there's some self defeating quality here because you know, if you find me more convincing, then it's not going to be my fault for not having done a better job uh, about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm not sure whether the billing of this is a debate is uh, correct or not. Uh, I'm still not sure whether we, how much we disagree about and how much we agree about. I'm hoping we'll find that out in the next few minutes. So, and several of you asked me beforehand, you know, what do I think about common good originalism and, you know, what are the points that we agree and disagree about? So I gull we'll start by saying, even now, uh, and after having read Josh's work, I'm sometimes a little confused about what common good originalism is. But I think to the extent that it is common good constitutionalism, it is bad. Uh, to the extent that it is really originalism, is good. <laughs> and there's a confusion about like when we merge these together, you know, is this 
originalism, it's just attempting to capture the market share of common good constitutionalism and sort of you know, convince people who might have been attracted by those kind of ideas that actually originalism speaks to these questions. And you know, if you believe, if you thought that originalism was limited to the things you read about uh, from people who were writing in the 1980s, you know, it turns out there's a lot more work that's been done in originalism. It can speak to a lot more of these questions, and originalism can, can speak to the, the telos and the preamble and the common good. It doesn't have to be a judicial restraint. If that's what it is, like we might disagree with everything. Um, but if there's something more to that, and sometimes it sounds like there's something something more to that, something that's uh, about giving less respect to the text, to the original meaning, to the legal principles that controlled the constitution of the founding, if it's about sort of trying to push those to the side to make room for something else, then we then we might really then we really disagree. Um, so common good constitutionalism is not present at this debate because Professor Vermeule refuses to do these kinds of things. Um, but uh, it is a kind of confused and anti-constitutional theory that rejects the idea that we the people have any power to make actual constitutional law that's binding going forward. Uh, you can read a whole uh, book review uh, about why that's wrong if you uh, want to, but we'll just put it to the side uh, for now and say that's, that's one approach that I think is not on the table. Originalism, which I think is what we're talking about or debating about, uh, is basically the theory that our law now is the law that we had at the founding uh, as it's been lawfully changed by our constitutional tradition. So of course that includes constitutional amendments, that's part of a uh, legitimate part of constitutional change. It includes various kinds of precedents and constructions of the Constitution, if, if but only if, they are consistent with the original meaning of the Constitution, that they're within these zones of ambiguity uh, Josh has talked about, uh, and you know, otherwise legitimate, plausible, and well-reasoned. Uh, so certain things like that can, can become part of the law, but that's it. Right? Our law has to be able to, to trace itself to the legal decisions uh, made at the founding. And that can include unwritten principles of general law, of common law, of natural law. You know, Blackstone is a part of the founders' uh, libraries, and that makes up part of the, the fabric of our, of our original law as well. And so originalism is just trying to, to resolve our current debates by reference to the legal materials that we, that we used when we created the country and everything, they've, and everything they've produced. And I think that gives us a lot of points of agreement. So I agree completely that judicial restraint and originalism are like just answering two different questions. Uh, sometimes they kind of work well together. So if you look at the founding era materials about the role of judges and the status of laws passed by legislatures, there's a pretty well established founding era principle that judges uh, need some degree of certainty before they go around saying laws are unconstitutional and refusing to give them effect. It's a debate in the literature about whether that's like the reasonable doubt standard or whether it's a preponderance of the evidence standard. They didn't have the rules of evidence until the 1970s, so like not all of these things are, are necessarily put in our modern terms. But that's a you know that's a, a legitimate debate. But the point is, originalism doesn't require judges to be potted plants. It doesn't it doesn't take it as evil or wrong or a problem when judges say, well look, the Constitution requires this. And that's not what the legislatures have done. My job is to enforce the Constitution. Uh, Josh is a big Marshall fan, so that's just Marbury versus Madison, right? Marbury versus Madison says. The job of the judge is just to interpret the law, take the Constitution, take the statute, lay them next to one another. If there's a conflict, you have to use choice of law principles to decide what to do. And the Constitution is higher law, established by the people, so it prevails. I think that's, that's completely right. And I think this identification of judicial restraint with originalism is, is sort of a political <coughs> accident. That in the 1980s, when people started, uh, when originalists started trying to own the word originalist, which was originally an epithet designed to criticize originalists, they, they were also in favor of judicial restraint, and so it became this label for a kind of pack of positions. But originalism was not, I think, invented in the 1980s. Uh, it was the method of law we had for, for hundreds of years. You didn't need a name for it when everybody was an originalist. It was just called law. Um, it's only once people invented other stuff, like living constitutionalism, constitutionalism, and that became so prevalent that when you said law, people might mean, think you meant that weird stuff that like David Strauss and Justice Douglas believe in, they needed a new label for like, you know, law. Uh, so for a while people used interpretivism, just meaning like, you know, we're the ones who believe in like actually interpreting documents, but originalism became the label, that's fine, that's where we are. Uh, but it's a mistake to think like that originalism was, was created by Antonin Scalia as opposed to discovered on the, you know, backs of several hundred years of, of precedence.
Also, I agree that sometimes the Constitution is ambiguous. You know, this is not all, that not everything is easy. Not everything is just a matter of, you know, looking up numbers in the text uh, or, you know, finding funny error dictionaries or even founding era corpus linguistics, if you're into that. Uh, and, you know, getting the kind of, like, list of everything that the Constitution does. Definitely, there are lots of there are lots of ambiguities in the Constitution, and that's of course where a lot of the action is. That's why we have to have so many courses on constitutional law, why we have to have so many cases and battles about the meaning of the Constitution. Um, and the idea sometimes you hear that originalism could make sure you know will eliminate judicial discretion, or will make sure that there are just like simple right answers to all constitutional questions, and make sure nothing is hard, is obviously false, right? The founders were originalists. They couldn't be anything else. They were the originals, right? So by <laughs> definition, they were originalists. And they disagreed about important questions, but they had fundamental debates about the scope of executive power in 1789, about free speech in 1791. Uh, and so if they couldn't agree on what the Constitution required in hard cases, despite all being the best originalists you could be, because they were there and had no you know, loss of memory, then you know we know you can't achieve perfect uh, lack of ambiguity or unique right answers to everything by being an originalist. Like the best we can do is, is to sort of be back in that world. That doesn't mean there aren't ways to, you know, productive ways to argue about those things. It doesn't mean sort of law gives up or there's, there's no hope, right? A lot of questions are easy. A lot more questions are easy than your other constitutional law professors will lead you to believe uh, if you do look at the original meaning. And when you do find these ambiguities, there's still a, a lot more we can say. Um, but, but it's true. There's a lot of ambiguity. Originalists shouldn't deny that. Right? That's that's the kind of question we care about. We care about now. And I think we all agree that when you get to those ambiguities, sometimes you have to do more than just kind of keep staring at the text and hoping the answer will come to you. Right? Uh, if you found an ambiguity in the constitutional text, something that it doesn't fully resolve, or whether you know multiple possibilities to read something. There's a limit to how much just like continuing to turn the page over and over again and hope the Constitution somehow <clears throat> gets to this topic or looking up, you know, word searches to the meanings of the words. There's a limit to how far that will get you. Uh, so to do originalism correctly, you have to not be limited to just the, the text itself. You have to be willing to look at the original law and original legal rules that were used at, at the founding to interpret the Constitution and even to supply kind of common law when the Constitution was signed. Right. They lived in a world of, of widespread common law, again, you know, tracing back to, to Blackstone and Mansfield and Camden and tons of other, of other jurists that they understood to kind of provide important kinds of law. There's a natural law, which is another form of, of unwritten common law that's fundamental to the Constitution. So all of that's a valid part of the originalist inquiry. And if, if common good originalism means that, right? if common good originalism means it's not necessarily a judicial restraint, it's not evil when judges decide to act. They should just be interpreting the Constitution, whatever that whatever that requires. Sometimes it'll be restraint. Sometimes it'll be action. Uh, they should just follow the Constitution, whatever it requires. Uh, they should acknowledge that the text is not uh, is not unambiguous. The text leaves some things up for debate, and we have to figure out what to do about that. And when resolving those debates, we can look beyond uh, the text itself. We can look we can look to the preamble, of course, and we can look to broader principles of our constitutional order. The word telos makes me nervous because it's not English. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, that kind of thing. Uh, then, then, I think we're, then I think we're totally in agreement. But I fear, from what Josh has said and from things he's written, that we may not be totally in agreement. Right? There may be more to it than that. Uh, so what I worry about is when you start saying things like, well, of course you should follow the Constitution when it's clear. But when it's ambiguous, you know, now we're talking. <laughs> I worry about the mindset uh, and the attitude that gives people who are in charge of interpreting it, who are supposed to be following the law. I worry that makes people excited to find ambiguities, right? Like, the Constitution is unambiguous. That's boring. You just got to apply the same law everybody else would. The Constitution is ambiguous, right? Now, now you have the chance to really do something. And then when you look at principles to read into the ambiguity, given that there are so many, so many different unwritten principles in our society, so much you can get out of these words in the preamble, which does include liberty in there as well, uh, but so much you can get out of that, then I worry that you can think, like, now we're, you know, now we're off the races. Now I can make almost any constitutional result I want to, but I think is good, will obviously also be part of the telos of the constitutional order, because it is good, and what I think is good, and so it's part of that. And then you can just start finding ambiguities everywhere and pouring in your own uh, political philosophy, whatever it is, to almost all major constitutional questions, right? 
That's the move that the living constitutionalists made, uh, that they've established decades of precedence on the basis of. That's the move that Professor Vermeule picks up and repeats in Common Good Constitutionalism with, with new language. But it's basically seeing uh, ambiguity as an opportunity in which the gloves come off and you can do whatever you want without being bound by law at all. That, it seems to me, is not originalism, is not law, is not good. Uh, so I guess I wonder, is that what Common Good Constitutionalism reduces to, or is there more to it than that? Right? Is it more uh, constraining? Is it more principled than that? So I'm, you know, I'm hoping Josh will tell us a little bit about sort of are ambiguities good or bad? Like, should should we be excited when we find an ambiguity because we think now, you know, now we've got a chance to do whatever we want, or should we think like, yeah, it's a little worrying when we find an ambiguity. You'd hope more of these things were answered by the Constitution that we should we should look harder to see if the uh, if the ambiguity can be resolved. And that brings us me to another question, which is, you know, how hard do you try to make the text unambiguous? Because look. The first time you look at the Constitution, a lot of it's ambiguous. Right? It uses a lot of funny words. Uh, we don't have the context for a lot of it. It's easy to imagine that words like due process and equal protection and privileges and immunities and free speech are these broad invitations to us to read in the, the principles that we want to. But you study them more, you learn more about what the words meant before they were put into the Constitution, why people put them in, what everybody said they mean. Often they become less and less and less ambiguous the more you study them. Not completely. Again, there are some things about which even the people who wrote them fundamentally disagreed. But you know, if you try, the Constitution can be a lot less ambiguous than if you are kind of happy to use the ambiguity as an excuse to as an excuse to do something else. So I'd be curious to know like what provisions of the Constitution really are ambiguous and what the what the ambiguities are. That brings me to, to the examples that uh, Josh teased at the end of his talk. Um, so one is McCulloch. Right, McCulloch is the ur common good originalist opinion. Uh, and that is clarifying, because if that's common good originalism, then I'm not for it. Right? I'm more of a Madison guy. So McCulloch uh, upholds the Bank of the United States in this kind of sweeping, non-textualist, loose language about uh, the ends and the means of the country and uh, the need to sort of do whatever you can to support the, the constitutional order. James Madison, our most serious, I think, constitutional thinker uh, in history, uh, had a different view. Uh, and thought that giving the federal government power to charter private corporations was going to lead to a form of lack of accountability and corporatism that would sort of destroy the principles of the separation of powers and liberty and federalism that were all the reasons we had the Constitution. And that was a, a big deal to imagine the federal government could just start spinning out these giant corporations and not what anybody thought they were doing when they created the Constitution. He's a great speech opposing the Constitution out of the bank. Uh, you know, he loses with time, but it still seems to me it still seems to me that he was right. And that brings me to free speech, uh, so the last thing that I'm really wondering about, um, which is how we should think about, about the scope of Congress's power to regulate speech, right? So when Congress steps in and thinks, like, this speech is bad, you know, is it just about animal crush videos or uh, the occasional slur uh, at a funeral? Or is this about sort of bigger stuff? So I think of another founding era debate about free speech, the obvious one that comes to mind is the Sedition Acts. And some people, John Marshall among them, championed the Sedition Acts, right, which uh, criminalized criticism of the Federalist Adams administration with very narrow defenses. It wasn't even a complete defense uh, that your criticisms were true. If they were sufficiently scurrilous and effective, they were going to uh, cause the government to suffer. Others, like James Madison, uh, thought that the acts were unconstitutional, that Congress's power to regulate speech did not include the power to sort of uh, go against the more fundamental natural law principles of the right to speak your mind on true matters of public opinion. So I guess I'm wondering, is the Sedition Act constitutional under common good originalism? <laughs> 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 no, no, no big deal. Um, all right, so a few things, I guess, about like uh, kind of the ambiguity. Should you be excited to find ambiguity? So look, I think the number one question that I probably get asked is, you know, isn't this some sort of kind of backhanded means to get your preferred results? Is this just conservative judicial activism? That's probably the number one most frequent form of pushback that I get. And you know, in Professor Bode's remarks, I, I, I hear a little bit of that as well. So let me just kind of give you like one clear example as to where I think common good originalism would, uh, would, would clearly 
I don't know about clearly, but in my opinion, it would not support the policy outcome that I would prefer. And that would be the Gonzalez versus Reich case. So if you guys have taken your, your common law, you're familiar with, with the Reich case. It's kind of this case out of California where this dude is growing marijuana in his own backyard. If I recall correctly, I think this was Randy Barnett's case that he litigated up to the Supreme Court. Uh, question is, you know, um, in, in McCullough versus Maryland-esque fashion, perhaps kind of crassly analogizing, really kind of more of a Wickard versus Filburn case, I guess, um, you know, d d does the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause, can it possibly reach the application of the 1970 Controlled Substances Act to this random dude out in California growing his weed for the marketplace of his own household? Um, and I would prefer the answer to be yes, because I am a barbarian on the drug issue. Um, and if I were monarch, I would illegalize all this stuff tomorrow. I, I am really hardcore on this issue as a, as a public policy matter. Um, I do not think there is any tenable interpretation of, of, the, of the Commerce Clause that could possibly reach this conduct for the very simple reason that if it did so, um, notwithstanding Justice Scalia's um, attempt to kind of make it make sense in his concurrence, if it did so, um, it would just make an utter mockery, I think, of, an, of the Article One, Section 8 construct of enumerated powers in the first place. It would just be two middle fingers in Madison's famous writing in Federalist 45, but kind of basic Federalist construct. Um, I would very much like that to be the case, but I, I just simply cannot do that. Um, you know, another example where I support the policy outcome, but I think it's still illustrative, um, you know, I think some, you know, we, we were talking a little bit uh, before uh, the event here about the, the, the D.C. versus Heller case. Um, my card's on the table, I am a hardcore gun rights guy, I'm a concealed carry license holder, I own an AR, all that stuff. But um, I, I nonetheless, I'm intellectually honest to concede that I think common good originalism, probably even more so than positivist originalism, probably could theoretically lend itself to the Heller dissenters. You might be able to get some sort of kind of common good -y kind of uh, telos purposive approach to the preparatory clause that might get you a little closer there. But I nonetheless think that it is fundamentally untenable for the very, very simple and obvious reason that the term right of the people, it is just utterly implausible, frankly, that the term right of the people would mean something different in the Second Amendment than it means in the First and the Fourth Amendment. I just find that completely implausible. So I, I'm not sure if you find that reassuring about kind of, um, you know, the, the, the width of the construction zone, but it is the case that there are any number of kind of construction zone debates there. And, you know, I, I do think that, you know, some originalist theorists probably have an overly narrow, overly constrained construction zone. And I think my project, in part, can be viewed as trying to kind of encourage people to be epistemologically humble about the fact that not all these questions have an overly narrow construction zone. And then kind of the, the corollary to that, and this is kind of the whole telos, preamble, ratio, legis stuff, is that I do think that originalist theorists in general have, I think, made a bit of a mistake by trying to kind of overemphasize kind of the historicist nature of the interpretive enterprise and underplay the extent to which original intent or perhaps even a mild form of, purpo of purposivism might actually make sense here. So, you know, original intent originalism was kind of the predominant form of originalism until, you know, the powers that be said that no, actually, OPM originalism, original public meaning originalism is actually the right way. But um, there was no particularly kind of clear, convincing reason as to why that necessarily must be the case there. Um, so, you know, I would not necessarily get excited about the fact that there are kind of these um, ambiguous terms in, in, in the Constitution, but I nonetheless think that it is a simple truism that a lot of these sweeping clauses that, you know, the 14th Amendment, the Privileges or Immunities Clause, you know, is a good example there. You know, look, to take a particularly unpopular example here, I mean, you know, the birthright citizenship debate of the Citizenship Clause, you know, where, uh, where our, you know, our very own Professor Epstein takes a heterodox view, if I'm not mistaken, you know, that's not necessarily a 50-50 jump ball on the historical research. Maybe it's kind of a 65-35 proposition, but there's, there's like real evidence there on both sides there. So if you are kind of, you know, if you are presented because, you know, the, the Wong Kim Ark is infamously, it's kind of dicta, they never actually directly kind of rule on the actual question, at least in my reading of Wong Kim Ark. So if you were kind of clerking on the U.S. Supreme Court and that question were presented to you, you know, if you were actually asked to inquire about, you know, birthright meaning and, and the citizenship clause, you know, would the best way to be to kind of go about this in just a purely kind of historical kind of corpus linguistics -y fashion? Or, you know, is, is it appropriate at a certain point to invoke something perhaps a little more than that, and where are you kind of where are you rooting that? And I would argue that is all that is going to come from this kind of slightly purposivist kind of tinge kind of approach with the, with, with with the preamble of the Constitution kind of doing at least some bit of legwork there. Um, you know, I, I guess one thing about uh, McCullough versus Maryland, um, I didn't know that you were a McCullough skeptic, by the way. Um, I, I, if I recall correctly, even Justice Clarence Thomas supports McCullough. I think he said so in a. Capri, the 2004-2005 case. 
Um, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, I just find that, I just I, I just find that 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 interesting to be to, to be honest with you. I, 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 I hadn't heard McCullough doubterism, I guess, recently in in, in, in these events here. Um, but yeah, I mean, to the extent that McCullough versus Maryland is kind of an overcoming good originals opinion, you know, I'm happy to kind of stand on that hill. Because, again, this famous line, let the ends be legitimate, that's, that's really exactly what I'm saying here. It is a slightly more, not overly textualist, slightly more kind of purposivist, tinged approach when in a realm of reasonable ambiguity. Um, the final thing that I'll just say, you know, um, I, 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 this, you know I, I, I know Professor Bode was, was being slightly snarky, and that's all fun and good, obviously. Um, <laughs> the, you know, the term liberty does, ap does appear in the preamble, but it's just a very quick word on that. Um, the, the wording of the phrase, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, um, I guess I would be remiss if I didn't know, first of all, the inclusion of the phrase, our posterity, is really profoundly Burkean, actually. This, you know, Burke's famous conception of a nation state as being kind of an, an intergenerational compact between the dead, the living, and the yet unborn. Um, also, if we're trying to be good textualists here, you know, secure the blessings of liberty. Um, it seems to me that the blessings is really kind of the end to be desired, where liberty here is slightly, it's, definitely partly intrinsic, but partly instrumental as well to actually achieving the blessings of pertinent to that liberty, which for the founders really kind of meant the virtues of religion really above all else. I found that mostly heartening. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm heartened to learn we're on the same page uh, about rage, uh, which I do think is, is wrong, uh, that it, it can't be that Congress has the power and the necessary and proper clause to regulate uh, conduct in the state of California is trying hard to keep entirely within its, within its borders. I think we're on the same page about Heller, although it sounds like you're making it maybe harder for yourself than you need to. Um, the, maybe the more interesting common good questions will come up, not when we're talking about the, you know, the easiest case, the right to have a handgun for self-defense inside your home, but the right to actually like have that gun with you in various parts of your life. Uh, the right to carry it in various public places, and so on. I think that that might be, for common good originals, and that might be the harder question, is when can the legislature decide that it's not consistent with the common good to have, have weapons in various places. But, but again, I'm, I, think I'm, I think I'm heartened by, uh, by almost all of that. Um, I think I'm puzzled, though, when we get to the, uh, again, to the question of what we're going to use to read into ambiguities and what count as ambiguities. So the example of, of birthright citizenship, right? The Constitution says all persons born in natural lives in the United States are citizens, uh, are citizens of the United States and the state where they reside, as long as they are subject to the jurisdiction thereof, as long as they're subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. So that's a sort of like weird, ambiguous carve out. People are like, who are these people who are born in the United States but not subject to the United States jurisdiction or exempt from birthright citizenship? As a matter of original intent, it's the most clear that Indian tribes what they had in mind, that the, the Indian tribes are spread around the country and still these kind of quasi-sovereign uh, entities that they maybe didn't have so sovereignty over. In the debates, people also bring up things like, well, what if there's an invading army occupying part of the country and then they're like, they have children there, like are they part of the jurisdiction and so on. But I think when you, when you dig into the materials, I think, uh, right, the balance of the materials suggests it's not a broader exclusion for, for immigrants or for illegal aliens who we regulate heavily, right, who are subject to our jurisdiction and are in our jails because they commit crimes that uh, are passed under our laws with no, uh, with no sort of jurisdictional immunities. And the idea, this is where I got kind of nervous, the idea that like you could say, well, yeah, one side has the better evidence, but, but it's only 6535, so I'm entitled to go with the 35. That's, that's what makes me nervous. Uh, that's what makes me think that the, the goal is not getting the best answer that the Constitution provides, and the goal is more, sometimes anyway, uh, finding opportunities to supply one's own answers, even if it's not where you, where sort of where you be led by the where you led by the materials. That makes me nervous. Um, using various kinds of evidence of intent, broader principles, the purpose of the Constitution to interpret ambiguities. That all sounds fine and good, uh, but again, if you're not careful, that can become a that can become a code word for um, for doing something very else that's not a lot of like law. All right, now just one thing on McCulloch. Uh, let the end be legitimate, <laughs> let it be within the scope of the Constitution, and all means which are appropriate, which are plainly adapted to that end, which are not prohibited, but consist with the letter and spirit of the Constitution, are constitutional. So yeah, there's ends in there, and there's means in there, but there are several important concessions along the way, right? The end has to be legitimate within the scope of the Constitution, fine. 
The means has to be appropriate and also plainly adapted to that end. Not just like any means, but like one that's, that's plainly adapted to that end. That's part of why rage is wrong. Uh, and they have to consist with the letter and spirit of the Constitution, right? There's some broader constitutional principles that we sometimes use to say, yeah, I see why Congress wants to do this, I see why it's pursuing a legitimate end, but, but it's outside of these other interpretive principles that, that are important to the Constitution. That was Madison's point. I still think it was a good point. Um, I'm not sure that Marshall has a good answer to it. Uh, I'll happily give you any time I have left if you want to talk about this edition. <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I was installed. I literally, I, I literally forgot that, that that's how we ended that uh, exchange. Um, I, I, I honestly am not sure that I have a good answer for you on this edition. Um, I'm probably more sympathetic to its constitutionality than you are. Um, but I'm not going to like sit here and say that like I am like an ardent proponent of the constitutionality of the Sedition Act. I probably have to review the text a little, a little more carefully. Is the, is the honest answer here? Well, thank you. We have time for a few questions now. Uh, Thomas. Um, yeah. Um, so this is a question for Josh. You make a big deal of sort of epistemic humility, and I agree that's an important value, but I think it just cuts against your position almost entirely. And the reason why is because if you're just a basic OPM originalist and you're faced with, with the question of the meaning of the text, even if it's a case of ambiguity, you're faced with um, an empirical question. So what is the meaning of this word? And even if there's evidence on both sides, um, there is at least some empirical evidence which, which can be used to guide your, your response to the question. On your view, you know, at some point, um, someone's going to come along and say, you've got to give us more content to what the, the telos is of whatever, whatever you said, the Constitution, of, you know, American democracy, whatever phrase it is. You've got to tell us what that actually is. Now, that's not a norm, normative question. Or, sorry, that's not an empirical question. That's a normative question. You can get three philosophers in a room, ask them what the telos is of whatever, and get four different answers. And any answer they give seems to be, will not be epistemically humble, quite the opposite. They'll be arguing from like, you know, general a priori principles, um, which other reasonable people can disagree with. It seems much more humble to take a more empiricist approach, just rely on, on trying to figure out what the words actually mean. So I, I guess my question is, you know, what, what's your response to that? You know, how would you suggest we find out what the, the TLO says while actually being sort of epistemically humble as, as you want? All right, this is, this is a great question, obviously. Um, wonderful question. So look, the Committee on Style at the Philadelphia Conventions in September 1787 consisted of like five or six members, if I recall. Uh, uh, Hamilton was certainly, I think Madison was on it too, actually, if, they, if I'm not mistaken. Governor Morris was, was certainly on it. They, they were the men who drafted the, the preamble. Um, and my claim is not necessarily that at the time the preamble was drafted, it was intended to have the purpose that I ascribe it. Uh, that is definitely not my claim. Uh, I've gotten that question many times. I, I, I would be a fool to suggest that to you. I, 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 I do not think. Rather, my, my claim, and this is why I like citing Marshall, um, I think Joseph Story, by the way, is also kind of an or common good originalist who very much kind of in the same jurisprudential mode as, as Chief Justice Marshall as, as I read him. My claim, rather, is that many of kind of the leading jurisprudential and indeed political statesmen for those first decades kind of intuitively understood that this was the tradition they were channeling. Not all of them, obviously, you had Jefferson, Madison. I mean, you know, they didn't agree on, 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 on a lot of things necessarily there. Um, but, you know, at some point, you ne you're, you're going to have to say which was kind of best embodied at that time. And I, I think in kind of the jurisprudential statesmanship of folks like Marshall and Story, you see this very kind of, again, implicit challenge, but not citing the preamble. Although Story in his commentaries does have a lot of wonderful language about kind of um, you know, the utility of, of preambles in, in interpreting in general. He actually was a, was a proponent. Um, he, spoke, he spoke quite highly. I, I cite this in the Harvard essay. I don't remember the exact quote verbatim, but he was a big proponent, actually, of looking at kind of this propulsivist twist as to the preamble there. Um, so, you know, look, I mean, uh, when it comes to epistemological humility there, I would be more sympathetic, I think, to your question if it, if it wasn't literally written, if they didn't literally tell us exactly what is I'm reading this document, what they, what they wanted, kind of, the tell us, as I call it, the ratio of ledges, as Blackstone called it, whatever you want to call it, what they actually wanted that to be there. And, you know, um, at that point, you know, when you were in kind of the construction zone, so to speak, um, would the most humble thing possible 
for a judge to be to just simply defer? Maybe, but that kind of then gets to the question as to what is the judicial power in the first place. That kind of raises a whole different set of questions. Is the judicial power just kind of judicial restraint, or are you actually asked, are you tasked with kind of engaging in judicial power? Um, and a very different conception of that would be kind of what Ralph Lerner would have referred to as judges as Republican schoolmasters, lowercase r Republican, obviously, um, which is this idea that, you know, Article Three judges in the limited confines of a case or controversy before the tribunal, uh, Professor Bode knows better than anyone. I am an ardent uh, foe to this day of judicial supremacy. So we're really talking here about kind of Article Three cases or controversies and kind of an anti-Cooper versus Aaron world here. You know, when you're with, when when you when you are there, what are you tasked to do with the judicial power? And you know, I, 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 at that point, I think the better view of the judicial power is kind of judges as Republican schoolmasters, less so kind of this blind deference, um, really in kind of Stephen Douglas' question on this. Um, so following up on that question, uh, it seems certainly true that they had this preamble and it could have meant this, but it also seems true that at the time of the founding, the generation that wrote this preamble, there were vast disagreements about the telos of the American order. Professor Bode has mentioned one with the Alien Sedition Act. There was Federalist and Anti-Federalist debates over the nature of the Constitution. Um, does that worry you that if, we, if judges were to adopt your theory and we got into the construction zone, perhaps all the time judges were really trying to do so, that essentially what all this would come down to is incommensurable moral debates in which both sides could point to something in the American tradition that supports what they want and then find it and justify their result? Or do you think there's like a possibility for dialogue within the construction zone about the common good and the telos the order like itself? I'm not sure I fully understand the question to be totally candid with you. I mean, I do think it is true that Americans have been hopelessly divided going back to the American founding. I mean, if you look at kind of the Jeffersonian Madison camp versus kind of the Hamiltonian John John Jay camp, they, you know, to a large extent, they disagreed about what the American Revolution even was, right? I mean, on kind of the rationalist enlightenment side, uh, the Thomas Paine being a good example, you had Jefferson would be an example too, of course. You know, you had this idea that the American founding was this kind of we are starting from scratch, this great experiment, uh, you know, uh, in individual liberty. Um, you know, heavy on the theories of John Locke, of course. Um, but, you know, an alternative view, which I think was kind of, uh, you know, John Adams, I think would be, or John Jay, they both very much kind of, I think, viewed it in this lens. You know, they didn't necessarily view it as, as kind of a clean rationalist enlightenment break. They viewed this as very much kind of a restoration of the English Bill of Rights of, of the 1680s, which was in, you know, infringed upon by the English crown. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, once you, once you recognize that, like, the, the men who drafted this disagreed as to what the whole war was about, then, you know, you, it, 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 it becomes a difficult enterprise, obviously. Um, I, I guess what I will say is this. Um, you know, one, I think part of what your question is getting at, which is another question that, that I often get here, is, you know, aren't these concepts kind of just, you know, also hopelessly ambiguous? I mean, like, what does it mean to establish justice, right? Um, and here is what I will say. This whole kind of broader kind of common good inspired project, and, you know, I think I can speak here not just for myself, but for Professor Vermeil uh, probably as well, who, again, that's not my theory, we're different, but um, I, I think a, a big problem for those who are trying to kind of propose these alternative approaches to constitutional interpretation is the idea here that legal education also simply does not give future judges and future constitutional statesmen the very tools that they need to actually grasp these concepts in the first place. That, uh, but then not you, to be clear. Yeah. Last question. Oh. So is common good constitutionalism good for Democrats or Democrats be formalists? <laughs> I'm gonna rip common constitutionalism. Yeah. So with the theory, people the, the people who are judges now who are partisan of Democrats, it would be better for the world if they became common good originalists and used their theory about the tools of the American order? Or would it be better if they stayed became formalists and only Republicans? So, if, you know, if I recall, uh, you know, Michael Stokes Paulson had a law review article after the Oberg Club decision for some NYU journal, if I recall. Um, I think I read it before I wrote my paper for your very class, actually. Um, and one of, the, one of the tools that President Paulson kind of recommended uh, that, that Congress should consider adopting was to statutorily prescribe a, a actual method of constitutional interpretation. He views this as constitutional under a necessary and proper clause application to the judicial power, right? Um, I, I would love that, I mean, in theory. I mean, I would love that, that, that Congress maybe could statutorily prescribe what I'm saying. I mean, if I had my druthers, that sounds like a great world to live in, honestly, right? Um, so I, I have no particular objection to that. The slightly kind of snarkier response uh, 
um, is, you know, I'm not really sure that um, a whole lot of kind of, I, I'll just be a partisan, I'm not sure a whole lot of kind of Democrat nominated judges going back to Caroline Products footnote four have been doing anything other than what you necessarily say they are, right? Um, I mean, so, I mean, you know, Elena Kagan famously said we're all textualists now. Tanya Brown Jackson says, you know, basically at her confirmation hearing, we're all originalists now. Um, you know, our mutual friend Professor Barnett, Barnett had that kind of triumphalist Wall Street Journal op-ed where he says kind of the triumph of originalism, where even Katani Brown Jackson is calling herself an originalist. And I guess my response to that is I view it the complete opposite way. I view that as not a triumph but a failure. That we have kind of allowed this term to be defined as such, as, as such an incredibly high level of abstraction that is so easily co-opted from people that can manipulate it to reach completely kind of alternative ends. I'm not really sure if I answered the question though. So, Mr. Klein, in the back. Sure. So, I mean, I, I look. I think different intellectual or religious traditions will define the common good as as they so please. Similar to what liberty can be defined by various traditions. For me personally, when I use the term common good, I am referring. They, I am I, my basic claim, and this is what you see in the Phelps studies. This is what you see in McCullough. Um, you know, certainly, I would say this is what you would see in Dobbs cases like that. Although I would take Dobbs a bit further, but that's neither here nor there. Um, my basic claim is that when that when you have kind of you know when you're in that construction zone, so to speak. Okay. And there is one claim on the one hand that would advance kind of an idiosyncratic form of kind of individual autonomy. So the, you know, Mr. Phelps and Phelps is a good example of that. This is a fairly idiosyncratic form of individual autonomy to spew out horrific epithets at a military funeral. When, when you have that on one hand versus kind of the soundness of the community, of the common wheel, of the general welfare, the common wealth on the other hand, then that to me is kind of the common good. I just follow up question. Yeah. So let's say the United States decides to nationalize the welfare system and the case goes before the Supreme Court. Under common good constitutionalism, can Congress entirely nationalize the entire health industry of the United States? Because in theory, that would advance the common good for all people, but it would, of course, impact the individual liberty, not that health insurance or you know, the separate pension is important. So I don't really have that. So it, again, it depends on the, on the wording of the statute, and then like you would have to see whether it's actually covered by the Commerce Clause. Um, you know, I, 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 I would be skeptical of kind of wholesale nationalizations of, 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 of entire private industry, but I would readily concede to you that common good originalism would probably make that claim slightly more defensible than kind of a Neil Gorsuch originalist approach. I mean, you could, probably, you, you could definitely make that claim easier on common good originalism grounds than on kind of Gorsuchian, Bostocky originalist grounds. I mean, I, I, I would de I, I, I'm definitely ready to, to concede that to you, but I couldn't answer that question without kind of seeing the text, obviously. I think we have time for one more question. Tim? This is a question for Professor Bowley. In terms of parsing out the differences between originalism as such and common good originalism, it seems like you're saying that you have something like Blackstone, so one step removed, long time reading thing. You might look to skip replication debates, maybe that's two, ste two steps of removed. You might look at a pamphlet, sort of a tumble at the founding, three steps of removed, just for argument's sake. Where is the principal line in originalist literature? It, it seems like both of you are arguing that to some extent there is kind of a purpose in the writing in the text that is relevant to interpretation. Where is the principal cutoff line for originalists? Like looking at a text that because its law is inherently purposive, but we're taking this as purpose but no more. So how, how do you, as an originalist but not yet a common good originalist, make that distinction of purpose but not too much? So my view is it's not like it's not like there's an exclusionary rule that says you know there are certain documents that should be like in a part of the library that only Josh gets to go to. Like it's fine. <laughs> it's, uh, it's fine to look at everything. The question is what are you doing with it, right? And the question is especially as an interpreter, what state of mind are you applying to it? Like are you looking at all this to try to figure out what did the people who ratify the Constitution 
what were they trying to do? What was their theory of the social contract? At least that we can that we can find one as if there was one. Or are you looking at to figure out like, okay, is this a good chance to use my theory of the social contract? Uh, and you know, do I have enough sources, like eight sources I can cite to like make that look plausible, and then we're off the races. That I think is the big question. Well, thank you to both of our speakers. Thank you.